Hi, it's Nicole. And yes, I had a haircut. Today I'm wrapping up books I read in May and the first two weeks of June because I'm going on holiday for the rest of June. You can go either way on holiday. I will either read loads on the planes, etc., or I'll not read at all. So I'll do the rest of the June books with the July books if there are any to talk about at all. I made three focused videos since my last wrap up. By focused, I mean videos where I talk about one or two specific books or authors in detail. So I made a video comparing and contrasting Poor Things, a 20th century novel by Alistair Gray and Frankenstein. If you are a fan of Frankenstein, you might want to check out Poor Things. It's quite different to the film and I prefer the novel. I made a video introducing a lesser known women poet called Amelia Lanya from Shakespeare's time. She wrote a poetry collection which is dedicated to women and written for women. We looked at a section where she defends Eve and what she did in the Garden of Eden with a feminist take on the four. Then I talked about the latest Shakespeare's play I read, Love's Labour's Lost, in the video. I watched a recorded Globe production from 2010 and a live show in Stratford-upon-Avon featuring Luke Thompson, whom some of you might know as the second brother in Bridgerton. That was the highlight of May. Because I've talked about those titles at length already, today I'll focus on the ones I haven't mentioned to you, The Year of Leah by James Shapiro, a non-fiction book about Shakespeare, North or Be Eaten, a children's fantasy by Andrew Peterson, and Sea of Tranquility, a work of speculative fiction by Emily St. John Mandel. 1599, A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare by James Shapiro was one of my two favourite non-fiction books as well as my favourite book of the year last year. It's about the year 1599 in Shakespeare's life as well as the life of London and England. I'll link that video here. 1606, Shakespeare and the Year of Leah was published in 2015, about 10 years after 1599 was published. Now we are in 2024, almost 10 years later again. I wonder, I sincerely hope there will be another book by James Shapiro coming out soon on another year of Shakespeare's life. I said in a previous video that if Shapiro writes a book on each year of Shakespeare's life and his career, I'd read all of them. In the epilogue of 1606, Shapiro mentions two more creative bursts of Shakespeare when twice more in his life he wrote three plays in the space of one year or so. I really hope Shapiro is working on one of those. <laughs> I want to know what happened when Shakespeare wrote every play, what historical events might have influenced his thinking, what gossip did he hear when his company performed in court? What sermons did he read? And everything else that might have found their way into his place. I used to see Shakespeare's works as things lifted out of time and space, but the author writes, it's no more possible to talk about Shakespeare's play independently of his age than it is to grasp what his society went through without the benefit of Shakespeare's insight. He and his fellow players truly were, in Hamlet's fine phrase, the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. The author says in the prologue of 1606, this book is about what Shakespeare wrote in 1606 and what was taking place at that fraught time. For the two are so closely intertwined that it's difficult to grasp the meaning of one without the other. 1606 is the year where Shakespeare wrote um, King Lear, Macbeth, and Antony and Cleopatra. Can you imagine creating those three works within 12 months? A few things stood out from this book. One is the ins and outs of the gunpowder plot. According to this book, a lot of the year of 1606 lived in the shadow of 1605, when, towards the end of the year, the gunpowder plot happened. 
well, nearly happened and didn't happen in the end, thankfully. The book makes me realize, isn't this extraordinary? There are so many historical events in British history. There are not that many that we still commemorate today. The fact that it's still on the calendar says a lot about the effectiveness and success of its portrayal by the government at the time, the propaganda, and over the following 400 years, and basically the power of storytelling. To quote the author, it is easy to forget that what sets the gunpowder plot apart from the subsequent infamous terrorist plots, especially those also significant enough to be remembered by their date, is that in this case nothing happened, which meant that like one of those great Jacobean dramas, its impact and aftermath didn't depend on actual violence, but rather on making people imagine an unforgettable tragedy, the kind that feels as real as Leah or Macbeth. Another topic that's related to the gunpowder plot is the term equivocation, which means ambiguity of speech and double meaning. You might remember the porter in Macbeth talks about three people knocking. The second one is an equivocator. That was an absolute buzzword at the time, and Macbeth is full of it. I loved reading about those. The second thing that stood out to me is James the King. I knew very little about him before this. The third thing is Shakespeare as a Jacobean playwright. When we talk about Shakespeare and his time, we usually think of the Elizabethan age. But Shakespeare's company became the King's Men in 1606, and for the last 10 years of his life, he worked and lived in the Jacobean age. I just didn't tweak that. One small complaint about this book, very small, <laughs> in contrast to 1599, the previous one, I feel like this talks about what happened during that time more than talking about Shakespeare. I am pretty sure a couple of chapters don't mention Shakespeare at all. I remember sometimes feeling impatient to get to know how all this related to those three plays Shakespeare wrote that year, but apart from that, absolutely love this. North or Be Eaten is a fantasy novel by Andrew Peterson for young people. This is the second in the win in the Wing Feather saga. My feeling for the first in the series was a bit lukewarm. A lot of Christian parents I know really enjoy reading the stories with their kids, but I'm on the hunt for the next Narnia for this generation, so with that standard in mind, I have to say I am not satisfied. <laughs> Having said that, some crucial aspects of the Wing Feather saga are way better than some other Christian novels for children I read. Let me tell you roughly what the story is about first. We are introduced to the Eagleby family. Grandfather, mother, and three children in the first book of the series, the, no, On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness. By the end of the first book, we discover that they are not simple village children, they actually are the heirs of a lost kingdom. In the second book, they are joined by an old scholar and family friend. They are on the run from the enemies and generally heading towards where this lost kingdom is located. The family moves through the story mostly together, and when they are separated, we follow the oldest sibling, Jenna. I got to know Jenna a lot in the second book. The author puts Jenna, a 12-year-old boy, under enormous pressure. At points, I even felt it might have become too dark and cruel for the age of the readers. I didn't enjoy the plot, but I really got to see how our young hero reacts and behaves in a crisis, and I agree with Andrew Peterson's approach. I'll read you um, a little bit. Jenna, at this point, was locked up, imprisoned in a box like a coffin. Jenna screamed and scratched at the walls and ceiling of the box. 
heedless of the pain in his hands or in his fingernails when they tore away. He was trapped in a dark so deep that light itself seemed never to have existed at all. He lost all sense of time. He kicked and scraped until his strength was spent and then lay there sobbing. He cried for ages until sleep came at last, but he dreamed of a giant nothingness, an empty hole into which he tumbled and disappeared. When he woke again, he found that the box was not an awful dream, but a black reality. He panics again. He lay panting in the blackness, talking to himself, praying aloud to the maker, accusing, pleading, screaming things that, while no one could blame poor Jenna for saying them, will not be repeated here. And the maker's answer was a hollow silence. I've read other Christian novels for young people where the author would deal with similar difficult circumstances by standing help immediately. The young protagonist would ask for help and the god figure in the story would appear immediately to save the day. Which I think can be unhelpful and misleading. It gives the impression that God will always come at your beckoning as you see fit and keep you happy, but in reality that's often not the case. When that happens, what conclusion would that lead a child to? So I like how Andrew Peterson allows at this point an incredibly loud silence. The maker does not appear or send any help. It's so much more relatable and gives much more scope for questioning and reflection for both kids and adults. I really love the author's decision here. Jenna wins my respect by the end of the story. One person that doesn't is his mother, Nia. She doesn't do anything bad, of course. She's the queen of this lost kingdom. But my problem with her is exactly that. She doesn't do anything at all. Apart from a couple of short scenes, she doesn't contribute much to the plotline. She's not particularly kind or intelligent or brave or helpful in their escape effort. I don't like her, but I don't mind her there. She's the children's mother, although she's a bit bland. For the children's sake, it's better they have her than not. Until the very end. She really annoys me when she feels entitled to back out orders to some deeply injured and round creatures and boss them around or try to boss them around. What makes her think her words would be of any worth or weight? She hasn't won my respect or affection throughout the whole book like Jenna or practically any other family member has. She might be set out as a queen, but she doesn't behave like one. Um, I don't think she's a good portrait of a queenly woman. I decided to try The Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel because Station Eleven was my favourite novel last year. I thought if I liked it so much, I should read another book by the same author. I started with the audiobook, and this was one of the very few audiobooks that I wouldn't recommend. I listened to a few chapters and did not get the cold, clear winter sky feeling of the writing that came through so strong from Station Eleven. So I stopped it and read it from the beginning again myself. It's a novel that's sensitive to spoilers, so I'll be careful. It's a story about the intertwining lives of a few characters which are connected by one supernatural event. There are many similarities between Sea of Tranquility and Station Eleven. In terms of the plot, we watch a few seemingly isolated characters who live in their own time and space and find out gradually how they are connected. The stories are told from different characters' point of view. It carries on the theme of the pandemic in Station Eleven. In terms of the vibe, I have this peculiar feeling that we look at the characters from a godlike point of view. The author writes in a way that makes me feel like I'm hovering above and around them. Sometimes I get very close and I can see their hair and their eyes, but I'm always ready to float away and 
retreat to a higher and more distant and detached place. I wonder if any writers out there can explain why. Overall, I have to say it's not Station Eleven. It doesn't give me as strong and wonderfully complicated feelings, but it made me happy that Shakespeare features again. <laughs> I'm going to carry books on holiday, obviously. I'm still trying to decide which. I'll definitely carry on reading Babel. I'm halfway through and have mixed feelings. I imagine I'll have a lot to tell you when I finish it. I was delighted to have found a little collection of Lamb's essays in a charity shop. A dissertation upon roast pig and other essays by a penguin. <laughs> it's beautiful and in perfect condition. The essays are on a range of topics which I can dip into. I have a bigger collection already which is a bit big to carry so this is just right. I expect Lamb to be funny and whimsical which I think will be perfect for your holiday. Lastly, nothing to do with holiday, I discovered this in a Waterstones. It's Paula Burns' biography on Thomas Hardy from the perspective of the women in his life. Looks very interesting. <laughs> I will disappear for a couple of weeks, apologies in advance, hope you are having a good summer. That's all for today, thank you for watching, I'll see you in my next one.